how do you wear this? Like this, I guess. Okay. All right, so we'll talk with the microphone now. So um, to verify that the email or text was not changed. So if we have some input text and someone gives us the, it goes over some unsecure network and we kind of get it, we cannot be guaranteed that that's what the sender sent. But if they gave us the hash separately and then the, the email, then we can check, okay, it, it matches. Or if we're downloading a file, we can check if the file has been correctly downloaded, if we can verify the hash. Um, so what is, uh, um, we have a question, what is a collision? Yeah. That's right. So why is that? Why does that happen? Yeah? Sorry. Exactly. Exactly. So by the nature of this hashing function, we see that here we have infinite possibilities because we have very short things and very long things and it's kind of infinite, right? But if we only have 256 bytes, then we have a finite set of what we're mapping this infinite set into the finite set, right? So we for sure have to have collisions, which means some inputs will give the same output, right? Uh, and that's a problem because someone can send us a fake document with the correct hash and say, oh yeah, th that's the contract you should sign. You verify the hash and it is correct, right? Um, so why, so okay, wh what is an avalanche property? So if I have a, if I have a contract and they, in, you know, the text, and in the contract they said you're gonna get uh, 500K salary and then someone came and actually changed it to 300, right? What will happen to the hash? Will the hash change a little bit or will the hash change completely? Yeah? Exactly, so the avalanche property is a property of the hashing function that if you modify just one bit of the input, all the bits in the output will be changed, hopefully or majority, right? So you want small disturbance in the original input to have huge impact of on the output. So where do we use hashing function as well? We use it a lot um, in, in cryptocurrencies in blockchain. Uh, we use it for data verification and we use it in uh, distributed computing. So we want hashing functions which are fast to calculate but are hard to find collisions, right? If we have a hashing function which is relatively easy to find a second, so I have input one which produces my, my hash, and if it's easy to find another input which produces the same hash, that makes a bad hashing function, right? So um, we had already examples in the past of um, hashing functions which were used for hashing passwords. So if you have password in your system, Unix or Windows, the password's not supposed to be stored in plain text because if someone gets access to that file, they will see the passwords. So the passwords are hashed instead. So instead of checking if a user logs in, uh, so you have a user, the user wants to log in, the user pa puts the, the normal passwords in, uh, then inside the system, you use the hashing function to take this password, calculate the hash of this, of this password, and compare this hash with the hashes in, the, in some sort of database or file, right? So the comparison is between the hashes, not between the password and the stored password. Uh, although some systems and some, um, some big companies are still doing it the wrong way and storing the passwords in the plain text, and then if there is a breach, there is this enormous uh, out, outcry 
that a lot of data has been compromised and so on and so forth. Um, but even if you're doing that and you have a hashing function which is quite easy to find collision, what will happen? What will happen is I can come, if I, if I got this file and I found out another password which maps to the same hash, I can use this pass2 which will map to H and get login even though I don't know the actual original password, right? So we want hashing functions which are really hard to do this. And as I said in the past, we had hashing functions, for example, MD5, which we used on Linux, which turned out with a bit of cloud resources, you can easily find collisions. So you can easily crack what is something that maps to a particular hash. So we stopped using it. So we're using um, hashing functions which are better at preserving this property. What else do we need for um, blockchain or cryptocurrency? We need some sort of peer-to-peer -peer system. Do you know what peer-to-peer -peer system is? Yeah, give me examples. Torrent, yeah. So torrent is a uh, file sharing protocol which works by the uh, distributing the, the files across a large collection of nodes. Um, we have to have um, some sort of a distributed hash table. Uh, do you know what hash tables are? Who knows what a hash table is? Yeah, what is a hash table? Yeah, so a, a hash table is uh, like a mapping between some, um, so let's say, you have some sort of keys, key one, key two, and so on, and it gives you a value. And then this is sort of like a hash table where you can look up things very quickly. So I can say, uh, what's the address of Marius? And if I have Marius here, it kind of gives, me, gives the caller the address, right? Um, so in distributed systems, if this is big, you don't want it to be sitting on a single computer, you want it to be distributed, so you can easily find where information is in kind of a peer-to-peer -peer distributed network. Um, so we have some protocols like CORD or Kademlia, which are efficiently implementing a distributed hash table. So instead of having it on the single computer, I have it across multiple computers and I can say, where is the file which starts with this? And then by doing kind of a quick lookup, I can get efficiently to that file. Uh, do you know what IRC is? Who knows? Yeah, what is, what is it? Internet Relay Chat, what is it? Yeah, it, it is kind of a peer-to-peer -peer on the server uh, layer and it's client-server between the clients, right? So you have clients which connect to the peer-to-peer -peer network and then on the server layer, you have peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, which relays all the messages. So you basically have like a chat uh, application. Um, you can say kind of an ancient way of doing Snapchat, <laughs> where the server is not centralized, it's distributed. Uh, and then you connect your client to that network, and then you can chat. So what is useful for um, blockchain or for cryptocurrencies or for this type of systems? Why do you think? Well, it kind of organizes the developers. They can chat and develop stuff. But why for the software it's useful? Yeah? That's right. So you need some form of initiating the, the distributed network. So if I have, um, so let's say I have, um, Yep. I have started my um, Bitcoin client and it needs to connect to the rest of the uh, Bitcoin network, right? So I have, um, I have my node and now it needs to connect to the rest of the network. The network is, you know, somewhere on the internet. Right, they are connected, they talk to each other, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, and then I booted my node, and then how do I connect to this network? 
there is one way, which is there will there is a well-known server which these guys talk to and say, oh, yeah, I'm here, this is my IP address, I'm here. And then I know the address of this server and I say, okay, give me some addresses of the node so then I can connect and become part of this network. But this becomes sort of a single point of failure. If this server is down, then nobody can connect to the network, right? Um, so you can say, well, so let's have few of those. We can have three, right? But that is not really solving the issue neither. Uh, you really want something which is always available and always um, kind of, you, you need another peer-to-peer <laughs> -peer network <laughs> to store the information about where these guys are and this is what IRC is, right? So IRC is sort of a nice uh, client server architecture which those servers are running and relaying messages for chat and you can say uh, on a particular private channel, okay, I'm, I'm now on this IP address, you can connect to me because I'm here. And then I can connect to IRC and get the updated list of where everybody is so I can connect to the network, right? So that's kind of uh, one of the building blocks which, um, which is used. Uh, so one more point, FIFO and LIFO, what's that? Do you know? Yeah. Yes, so th those are kind of a queuing types. Um, a queue is a, another data structure where you basically put stuff in to a queue. It's like a normal life. Uh, so if I have a new item, I can edit here and I'm reading stuff from here. So this is uh, first in, last out or I can uh, put stuff in and read from here, right? So I, I have um, a model where, um, uh, yeah, so this one is, uh, this one is last in, first out, and the other one was first in, first out. So the one who was first added to the queue will be the one read from the queue first, right? Um, so, Yeah, we have a bit more to go through. Uh, so who knows public-private key cryptography? Yes, how does it work? Briefly, yeah? Exactly. So with the, there was a RSA as an example of an algorithm. Um, and you have public part and private part. And then as described in the slides, you can, um, you can use the uh, private part to hash something. And then the public part can be used to verify that the message was authentic. So you can use this mechanism for uh, providing a proof of authenticity. Similar to hashing, but stronger because anybody can hash something but nobody can sign a message with a private key because only the owner of the private key can do that, right? So it, it has kind of a similar use cases, but much stronger uh, properties. And then you can use it the other way around. You can distribute your public part and people can encrypt stuff that only an owner of the private key can decrypt, right? Um, so this allows uh, to do ownership because if I want only you know, one person from the group to be able to read it, I can use that person public key, encrypt my message and give it to everybody, but only that person will be able to open it, right? Um, so we have a question, kind of a more advanced question. Why do we use elliptic course cryptography versus uh, some other ones like RSA, for example? Yeah, so th this kind of um, is because uh, elliptic curves provide us stronger cryptographic properties than other mechanisms. So um, unlike with hashing, um, I can have bigger and bigger kind of a crypto space, um, kind of abstractly speaking. So I can say if I have, um, because I have a private part and public part, right? 
So the public part is by definition public. So how hard for me is to work out what the private part is given the, the public key, right? I have to find some sort of a sequence which maps to the public part, right? So if I use a very short public key, uh, then I can, by brute forcing all possible combinations, I can find what the equivalent pub, uh, private part is, right? So to make it kind of more secure, we have to use longer and longer keys, so it is harder and harder to brute force it. But also when you brute forcing it, you want, same as with hashing, you want some properties which make it really hard for finding it. So if there are some structural um, uh, regularities, which make the search faster that I don't have to look through all possibilities, then this brute forcing will be kind of more efficient. So because of those properties, we, like cryptographers, they try to find those crypto systems which are really hard to reverse. Um, all right, so now we're getting into more, um, more nicer uh, territory. So we decided that we have to um, develop this, uh, let's say Bitcoin hasn't been invented yet, we have this idea for a distributed ledger and we have to store uh, who has how much money. Uh, we could store it in the database, but we don't want this single point of failure, we want it to be distributed. So we have this concept of distributed databases, right? Um, so what is the difference between a distributed database and blockchain? Okay, we haven't talked about what actual blockchain is yet, right? Um, so, yeah, we will come back to that. So, what is a ledger? Yeah? Uh, yeah, that's right. So, it, it is effectively kind of a like a, a table which specifies uh, who, so for example Alice and Bob, and Alice has 10 of something and Bob has 20 of something, right? Uh, and then if Alice uh, bought something from Bob, uh, so this is at time t, and then at time t1, our ledger might say that Alice has now 5 and Bob has 25 because Alice paid Bob some for something, right? So the ledger is kind of like a s um, accounting book for storing who owns, uh, who has how much money. Uh, what is barter? Yeah? Uh, yeah, that's correct. What else you can use barter for? for trading. So um, you can use some physical item to trade for another physical item, right, without the use of money. Um, and then we have money. Uh, so what is money? We will spend a little bit of time discussing it. So before we get to money, uh, we have to go back in ancient history and kind of discover that we didn't have money all the time. In kind of ancient times, we used to live without money. Uh, and we had something based on either barter or gift economies. Um, so gift economies were kind of um, a way of organizing society before we invented the concept of money and before we even invented the concept of barter. Um, and it is still, uh, it, it does still exist. I mean, we still give each other gifts. Uh, and in New Zealand, it, is, it has its uh, term, koha, and it, it means that if you have more of something that you need, you just give it to, s to somebody else for with no kind of strings attached in hope that when they have more of something that they, they don't need, they will give it back to you, right? Um, so we kind of started with this uh, and then we discovered that it, it works fine in some circumstances, but sometimes you really need, need something, right? So you really need a chicken and you have a lot of apples, right? So you just ask the person with chickens if they would exchange a chicken for an apple or a bunch of apples. So uh, we invented kind of the notion of trading by exchanging goods. Um, and then we invented 
the, the kind of the trading based on representative money. So we, we did that around 600 BC, where we discovered that it's kind of good to have um, kind of something that we can um, use instead of real goods. Um, and the most interesting example is uh, rice stones. Do you know what rice stones are? Um, there is an island in on Pacific um, where they uh, wanted to have representative money, and they used those um, giant stones, um, which had to be carved and carried from a faraway island to this island. So having this stone was kind of something that was really hard to fake because you either have that stone or not. But also trading with those stones was quite hard because you could buy, let's say, two houses for one of those stones. So if you bought a chicken, you have to say, okay, now part of this stone is yours and part of this stone is mine. So they had to keep a ledger of who owned what part of, the, of those giant, giant um, stones. You can, you can uh, have a look and, and read about it. It's kind of the most bizarre way of using representative money, um, which we know of. So it sort of uh, solves, the money solves a couple of problems. So first of all, with barter, you have the problem of uh, double needs. So you have to coincide that someone needs what you have and they have what you have, right? Uh, so you have to have this time dependency. If you have money, you can, you can um, bypass it in more asynchronous fashion. So um, it solves the, the coincidence of wants problem. Um, it's much easy to um, calculate how much of value things are because you have this kind of unit of account, which is standardized. So um, if you trade with barley and with gold and with chickens, then if something is worth you know, 10 kgs of barley, how much is it worth in chickens? It's kind of hard to con convert between all those barter currencies. But if you have representative money, it's sort of more represent re representational and you can do that much easily. Um, so we have this concept of fungibility. Uh, do you know what fungible means? Fungible means kind of indistinguishable between it something. Like if I have a... Um, um, I don't know, one liter of water and I have another liter of water, it doesn't matter which one I have because a liter of water is the same, uh, right? So if, if you buy a bottle of Pepsi, you know, you don't care if it's this particular bottle or that particular bottle. I mean, they, you know, they are interchangeable. You can get this one or this one. Um, Non-fungible means that there is some difference uh, between one item and the other item or one coin and another coin. So. For example, if I have a, a banknote of uh, 100 krona, um, and you have one as well, we can just swap it and it will make no difference, right? Uh, does it matter which exact banknote do you have? Or it doesn't? Is Norwegian krona fungible, yeah? It doesn't matter, right? Um, so in normal circumstances, it doesn't matter. When it matters, yeah. Yeah. So if one of the nodes are fake, of course, but let's say they are all legitimate. Uh, but if there was, let's say, a bank robbery and there were money stolen from a bank, and the bank has the serial numbers of the bank notes which were stolen, suddenly, particular bank note might be the one which was stolen and the rest are kind of legitimate, right? So if you try to trade the one which was stolen, the, you know, the cashier in a bank or somebody who checks it may say, oh, actually, I'm not going to do the normal p things because you have the one which has been stolen, right? So the banknotes are not uh, you know, entirely um, fungible because they have a serial number, but they are kind of fungible for all terms and purposes that we normally use them for. So how about Bitcoin? Um, is it fungible or, or not? So again, we haven't talked yet about the Bitcoin itself. How does it work? Uh, but in Bitcoin, you have um, the coins represented as a change of the transaction which happens in the ledger. And that change has all the history attached to it. So a particular coin 
has all this history of who owned it initially and how it got to you. Um, so it's not really fungible because those histories are different for each individual coin. Um, it's similar with Ethereum. And also we use it as a store of value. So as here with the uh, time dependency and with the uh, asynchronous exchange, we also can store value for an extended period of time with money, not uh, cryptocurrencies, but with money in general. All right, so um, if we fast forward to modern times, uh, we use representational money and we use kind of um, electronic currencies for most of the time. Uh, you still deal with a physical paper-based money, uh, but most of the transactions we're using cards and we're using electronic transfers and banks are doing the same. Uh, so we have quite a lot of experience dealing with electronic currencies before Bitcoin happened. Uh, but there is a kind of fundamental difference. So the difference is um, the normal currencies are regulated by governments. Uh, and they are kind of distributed into the world by the federal bank or the national banks. And they do that by either printing money or by um, lending you know, uh, money. So if I want a mortgage for uh, buying a house, the bank doesn't give me a lot of paper. The bank just changes some numbers in the bank accounts and they kind of effectively create some money by doing that. So with the um, Bitcoin, we have the difference that it's sort of non-regulated by any of the uh, countries. Uh, you may ask, okay, so what's so, uh, so good about that? Well, um, so some people think that you have a problem if you let um, governments decide how much money to print. So how do they do, they do that? How the governments decide how much money to print? Yeah, how 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 that happens? It's hard. <laughs> they, they, you know, it, it is a hard problem. The, nobody really knows how much money to print for the economy to work well, right? So we kind of doing it by trial and error. Sometimes we print too much. Sometimes we print too little, right? In two thousand and eight, the U.S. banks lended borrowers too much money. And then it resulted in the you know, uh, housing market crash because there were too many loans given to people. So there was effectively more money than it was actually worth it, right? Uh, we have examples of that happening uh, in different times at, at different scales. Um, so um, during the, uh, just shortly after the First World War, there was a, a very famous uh, Deutsche Mark market crash. The government borrowed too much money and then they were buying <coughs> currencies from other countries and that led to hyperinflation and the currency kind of crashed. So um, 10 years ago, uh, a, a, a bunch of enthusiasts on October 31st released this new currency. Uh, it uses um, those technologies which we just described. It uses a peer-to-peer -peer system. It uses uh, pseudonymous transactions for tracking the currencies. And the currency was sort of gradually released into the world by the mining um, um, protocol. So the way, the way it works is you have um, the... <laughs> you have the initial block which is like the, the one which starts everything. And to make, to make this one for Bitcoin legitimate, they've used kind of a, a special description, which was used for, which was the text from the newspaper, which was sort of validating that this block co couldn't be computed earlier than a particular time. So you have a guarantee of a date of when this first thing happened, right? You have no other guarantees, but you have guaranteed that it hasn't happened earlier than this particular date. Uh, and then from this date, um, the blocks were being mined um, and they are connected to with each other. And um, there was a reward of 50 BTC for who finds first the next matching block. How do you do that? Well. What's inside the block? Inside the block, you have kind of a date 
of when it was discovered. You have uh, some initial value for doing solving the, the computational problem that you have. You have to have the hash, which um, has particular properties. We discussed the hashing function before. And you have a list of transactions which are basically sending coins from one account to another. So this is the, the data field, which is hashed using this data and this nouns uh, field. And then finding out this hash, so the hash is you know, a sequence of bits. Uh, so I can say, whoops. So this might be the hash for the first block. Um, you can modify this number here. This is one number that you can modify. If you modify it, what will happen to the hash? It will completely change, right? So if you change this one bit here, th those bits, the rest of the bits you cannot change because they are kind of form the, the, the actual block. But this one is up to you to change, right? So if you manipulate this one number, you can change how the hash looks like, right? And the problem is uh, we need to force the computers to do some work for some time. So they invest the time. That's how Bitcoin works. Uh, it's called proof of work. They're proving that they burned certain amount of electricity and did certain amount of work. So we have to have some mechanism to do that. And the mechanism is, is very simple. It basically specifies from the start of the number how many zeros we want in the hash. The more zeros we say we want in the hash, the harder it is to find a hash which has this property, right? Because um, you have a particular constraint, and what you're doing, you're manipulating this number and hashing the, the rest and saying, okay, I got something which has two zeros or no zeros or whatever, right? And if we say we want n zeros here, that makes it harder and harder. The longer we put this, the longer it takes to actually find the hash which has these properties, right? So the network, the distributed network, specifies what is currently, so the peers talk with each other and they say, currently we need n bits to be the proper hash. If somebody finds, you know, n minus two, like the it has uh, zero, zero, but has n minus one, there is one here, it, it's rejected, right? You can have more. So you can find uh, a hash which has more than n, but the it has to be at, you know, at the limit. And then once this block is found, this block is advertised to the network, and they kind of all the nodes add it to the to the chain. Um, so is it possible for so let's say we are in the in the time time f like. We are currently at block capital N, and we have a number of people trying to find the next block, trying to find what will be the, uh, so let's say N is here, N plus one. Is it possible that two nodes will find the hash roughly at the same time? Yes, it's possible. So what will happen then? They will, let's say this node, found the next block, and this node found the next block. And then this node advertises, oh yeah, I have the n plus 1 is this. Let's call this block b1. And this says, yeah, this b2 also matches. So it uh, advertises b2 to its neighbors, and this node advertises to its neighbors. And we have kind of a situation where we have two. We have b1 and b2. So this is um, this happens, and that happens for a while, right? So now, if this uh, miner advertised the B1 to the neighbor, and this neighbor now found a B, the N plus two block, um, so the N plus two will have B1 as uh, the parent block. So we have a situation where the chain kind of grows here or grows here. So we have kind of like a fork. We're calling it a fork um, because it forks into two chains. It could have more than two. It could have three. Very rarely happens. 
uh, with two, it happens. And then what, what happens is um, if a node gets advertisements uh, and particular node gets advertisements from the neighbors and they say the current uh, latest block is, um, so let's call this one B3, right? So let's say this node thought um, B2 was the latest um, block, but it received a new advertisement saying actually B3 is the latest one and B3 chain doesn't include B2, right? So the nodes have the preference for picking the longest chain instead of the shorter. So it will change, it will say, okay, if B3 is the, long, uh, is the top one now, then B3 is the top one, and B2, uh, B2 never happened. So uh, for this node, there is kind of a, a swap that the, the node was kind of following this path to B2, and at the advertisement of B3, it kind of drops this and says, actually, this is now the, the correct path. And all the nodes are doing it independently. So it is kind of like a kind of um, uh, chance game to an to a, to a extent, right? So if you have a fork and you have two potential histories, it is kind of non-deterministic which one will win eventually, right? Um, so what happens is you have this uh, double spend problem. Double spend problem is if someone spends, spends money twice in this chain and in this chain, then one of those money will not actually get to the receiver because after a while only one proper history of, um, proper version of the history can happen, right? Um, so you have this concept of uh, waiting for sufficient amount of time before you can confirm your transfers, right? Um, if your, uh, if your transfer happened kind of in the past, it's very unlikely for the entire history to be invalidated by a longer chain which now catches up, right? Um, generating a block on average takes about 10 minutes. That's how the uh, Bitcoin protocol works, that it's um, adjusting the difficulty of this hashing to roughly work out for the network to take 10 minutes to come up with the next block. It varies. It varies from, you know, four, five minutes to over an hour sometimes. Uh, so the, it has a spread, but on average, you can say the blocks are kind of generated every hour, uh, every 10 minutes, so six blocks in an hour. Um, so you may say kind of uh, relatively safely that if something has been in the block for more than six uh, blocks, then it's very unlikely for, for somebody else to have computational power to generate a longer block than the one that we already have, right? Um, all right, so um, we skipped that. Um, yeah, we can skip that as well. Um, so same as with the electronic currencies, this currency relies on the computer network to operate. It's not owned by anybody because those, all those nodes are kind of run by volunteers. Although in the recent times, more and more commercial um, entities are, are, are dedicating, you know, substantial computational resources to this. Um, and it is linked sort of to real money, but not really, and also to commodity trading, but not really. So there is a, a debate in many countries how to treat the, um, the currency, whether it's actually equivalent to the normal currency or whether it's just equivalent to barter trading. And in different countries, the regulations are different. Um, in Norway, it's mostly treated as a currency, although it's not really that legitimate. So n banks don't deal with this. Uh, there was one exchange which was running here a few years ago, uh, and they had to close because banks didn't want to deal with them. Uh, and this is because of the nature of the uh, value transfer that you cannot track reliably where the money comes from and where the money goes to. And the banks are required to have very strict rules of tracking the transactions for anti-money laundering uh, purposes and uh, not financing terrorism and so on. Um, with this system, it's kind of hard, so that's hard for them to enforce this. Um, the exchanges are enforcing it by tracking 
the people who are uh, buying and selling. So most of the exchanges do that reliably these days, uh, but the banks are still quite uh, resistant to, um, to use it. So um, it can be used to represent anything. So we are, like Bitcoin is using it to kind of track some monetary value, but you can use it for other purposes as well. Um, so for example, you can use it for voting systems, or you can use it for uh, just tracking transactions, like as we did in the hackathon for tracking the uh, modifications to some music or some art piece, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be about money. Although this aspect of uh, blockchains having some sort of incentive mechanism is important because that incentivizes the individuals to run the, the nodes, right? But if you say, well, we don't need to incentivize libraries to, to use it because libraries will run the, the nodes, then you can have some bookkeeping system which doesn't have money kind of uh, connected to it. All right, so let's have a um, 10 minutes break and we will start uh, 15 after 11.
guess we can try that. Better? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, yes. So we've we've covered that. We've covered that. Please work. Okay. It stopped working. So um, we sort of stopped at. Um, oh, come on. Doesn't want to work. Yeah. Anyway, so um, we uh, so let's try this one. Maybe something with network. Um, we kind of ended up with having this uh, distributed peer-to-peer -peer system, um, where we have the ability to uh, record transactions. Um, so. Why is it? Um, why do you think Bitcoin happened? Why do you think um, you know uh, Satoshi Nakamoto released it uh, ten years ago into the wild? Yeah. Mm hmm. So what what is the advantage of the decentralized system? Exactly. So it, it is kind of has to do with control, right? Who controls it? And one of the key differentiator here is that in, in particular case of Bitcoin, that it is kind of not controlled by any single entity. So you have miners who are doing the verification of the blocks. You have the developers who are developing the client software. You have some users who buy or not Bitcoins. Uh, but none of the groups individually can do anything to the to the system itself. You can have a fork, which means a group of people may say, we want similar properties, but we don't agree with the current system and we want to have so it's something different. And they have a so-called hard fork, right? So we have Bitcoin Gold, which is a fork of normal Bitcoin, which was a subgroup of the developers deciding that they want something else. Uh, and they decided to split the the client code and then people who are participating are now kind of uh, maintaining the other fork, right? But you need people running those nodes. Um, so it is about control, uh, but it's also about reliability, right? So for example, um, what will happen to your Norwegian records if Norway is being invaded by a foreign force? Let's say Russia decided at some point to do something here. They, you know, put a lot of troops into Oslo. And then what will happen to your records? Well, they can do whatever they want with the records, right? Um, with systems like this, you can prevent modifications even if a particular data store is kind of uh, compromised. Uh, so you could imagine that you could have a system in the world which prevents your personal data to be modified by anybody, including the government, right? Uh, because the technology allows that. The technology allows to have robust distributed systems which are not controlled by any single entity, and they would need to be taken down entirely with the internet. Otherwise, they kind of persist, right? Um, what is the advantage of BitTorrent versus the file sharing systems which were before that. 
it's faster, it's better protocol for one. But what else? Yeah? Yes, there is kind of a more security, more verification built in. But the, the biggest advantage is the way the files are discovered. Uh, with the previous file sharing systems, you always had kind of an easy way for shutting it down by shutting down the, um, the like in Gnutella, the one which kind of knew about where the files are stored. So the files were transmitted kind of peer-to-peer, -peer, but the information about where they are was still somewhat centralized. With BitTorrent and with magnet links, you have a very robust mechanism or distributing that information around, and it's really hard to, to shut it down, right? So, um, of course, BitTorrent is used for illegal, I, you know, intellectual property downloads, uh, and the intellectual property owners want, would like that to be shut down, so they target some sort of a torrent um, search engines and so on, but it is kind of difficult to, to take it down, like it, it's not possible, right? Uh, so it demonstrates the sort of the robustness and the power of distributed systems and um, systems like this. Um, yes, so um, I, yeah. great, I have the slides back right on time. So, um, centralized ver versus decentralized systems. Um, we sort of, historically, we were quite a decentralized people for thousands of years. Uh, we used very peer-to-peer -peer way of buying things. You get go to the market uh, and you buy X and you buy it for cash, right? Uh, it was not kind of tracked. Uh, we've used to use cash for, for a long time uh, and it wasn't tracked. Uh, so the kind of the decentralized systems are not new. It, it sort of, uh, it has been there before for, for a very long time. The centralized systems are kind of the modern invention. They make things more efficient. Uh, you know, Google search make, made it efficient because they aggregated everything. But with centralization comes some uh, problems as well. And, and we see that, for example, with Facebook centralizing the kind of public opinion making, it's kind of problematic. Um, so we, we sort of looking at where decentralized systems make sense and what are the advantages of using decentralization versus centralized systems. It's not like that one of those models is better than the other. They, they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. So one of the biggest weakness of decentralized systems is the lack of efficiency, actually. So we can only do around seven transactions per second with Bitcoin, right? Uh, with Visa, which is a centralized system managed by Visa, we can do 40,000 transactions per second in the peak. Uh, so there are trade-offs. Um, there is a, a mechanism which we work with the, with the department on using um, off-chain transactions in Bitcoin or other blockchains like this where people actually send money in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion instead of logging everything into the blockchain, which makes scalability and uh, processing time of transactions much faster. That is considered to be the next sort of generation of uh, Bitcoin or blockchain usage for kind of financial transactions. Um, so we've, we've already talked about it. Um, it was kind of interesting uh, 10 years anniversary just recently that uh, the Bitcoin is around. Um, they've done it somewhat um, um, not entirely in the open. It was kind of a bunch of uh, enthusiasts initially um, launching it and using it and playing with it. Uh, it didn't take off until a bit later. Um, and it is self-regulating. Um, so, and by self-regulating, it's a positive and negative thing, right? So the positive is that nobody can enforce any control the negative is that nobody can enforce any control. <laughs> so it is a bit chaotic. It's a little bit, uh, it, you can say it's democracy and as it's extreme that, you know, uh, nobody can enforce anything. Nobody can enforce rules. It, it is by all the nodes which are participating kind of implicitly voting on that particular state of affair. Uh, we never had that before. We, we kind of experimenting with it as, as society as well. Um, 
So yes, we've already talked about it. Um, I could show you kind of a more technical things, but um, so for example, there is a block explorer where you can track, you can see the details of all the blocks, but it kind of goes a little bit into the nitty gritty of the technical uh, aspects. Uh, the, um, the interesting ones is the, the mining blocks, so solving this puzzle, which I explained to you. Um, and you have to do it by brute force. So you're basically using your, C your GPU or special um, processing units spe speci uh, specifically designed to crunch the hashes to come up with those hash, which has those properties. Um, and then um, we've already talked about it. There, there is a halving of the reward for the miners. So the first, um, the first happened in 2012. Um, it went to 25. Uh, two years ago, we had halving of the uh, reward to 12 and a half, and then the next one will happen at some point. Um, so, <coughs> yeah, the longest chains wins. Uh, we've discussed that. Um, I will not go into the details of how it is organized. Um, the important thing here is that the, um, the confirmations of how the transaction happens between one user and the other happens with a bit of a computer program. So all blockchains use a little bit of computation to validate the hashes and validate who the sender and receiver is and whether they are public key match and so on. So they need a bit of logic. And Bitcoin is extremely simple, simplistic in this logic because it has a very fixed number of operations that you have, but you can encode some logic of what happens when the particular transaction is happening. Uh, and this logic is validated by everybody. So everybody who validates the, that the blockchain is consistent also validates this, this logic, the, 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 a little bit of code. And what it means is that you can have something called um, smart contracts, right? Um, the name is a little bit confusing, like they are not really smart and they're not really contracts, but they, they just a, pit of a, a bit of code which is executed when somebody sends a transaction to somebody else. And that bit of code can do some logic, can do something, right? So you can check, for example, that certain properties are hold before money transfer happens. But you can use it for fun as well. And I have, um, I have an example here which uh, seems to have some problems. Um, so imagine that we want to play uh, rock, paper, scissors, okay? So I can ask one of you to come here and play with me rock, paper, scissors, fine. What if we want to play it over a telephone? Can I play rock, paper, scissors over a telephone? To some extent, if we kind of synchronize ourselves, right? So if we say one, two, three, and say aloud what we want to say, but there is a bit of a delay, it, it sort of doesn't work that well, right? Um, so can you play rock, paper, scissors over the internet with somebody else? How would you do that without Skype? Could you play it over email? No, you cannot really play it over email, right? Because if I got an email with your decision, I know what to say to win, right? Um, so how would you normally do system like this? Normally you would ask somebody to be a trusted person, right? You would say, I will email you my guess, my, my vote for rock, paper, scissors, and somebody else will email you and then you say who was the winner because you will be the trusted person who knows whether, you know, what we said, right? Um, and that's how we do a lot of things in the real world. In the real world, we have institutions, we have a lot of systems which rely on so-called trusted third party. Um, and it works effectively like this. You sort of delegate some of the responsibility, some of the trust to the trusted third party to manage the interaction or manage the data or manage whatever they are managing for you, right? Um, but using cryptography, you can play rock, paper, scissors over an email. Um, the slides don't work, so I will kind of quickly explain, right? Um, you agree with somebody that um, you will um, use R for rock, P for paper, and S for scissors. 
and then you will attach additional something in front of it to kind of mix it up, right? And then you will calculate a hash using a well-known hashing function, right? So you have three choices, and then you have a hash. So let's say I have my decision being D1. And then you have your decision being D2, and you did the reverse. So you, sorry, you also have uh, three options. You've hashed them, and now I'm waiting for your hash, right? And you're waiting for my hash, right? So at the end, I have D1 and D2, and you have D2 and D1. If you send me your hash before I send you mine, I still don't know what you said, because I don't know this, this prefix. I cannot find out what is that you said before you tell me what this is, right? Um, because I only see the hash. Um, if you didn't use this, I could hash those three things with the, um, those three strings with this well-known hashing function, for example, SHA-1, uh, and then I would know what did you say because the hash would be the same. But because we're using some randomness here, I don't know, right? So I have to wait for you, all for you to tell me the hash, and I, uh, and I don't know what you voted for. The same for you. And then once I have two, then I release this, uh, let's call it a secret, uh, secret S to you. And then you can see, uh, because you can attach the secret to R, P, and S, what did I vote it, right? But without the secret, you cannot. So we have a protocol. We say, OK, uh, you email me your choice. I email you my choice. Once we have the two things, uh, one of us is the winner, right? And you can encode it into this logic of the smart contract and say, the winner gets, you know, we put some money in. So you put, um, you know, 100 Norwegian krona, and I put 100 Norwegian krona. And we do this, and once the winner is revealed, then the winner takes 200 krona, right? I can have a game like this without a trusted third party which exchanges the value between two players without the house. So I can have effectively a casino which is um, entirely um, unbiased without a casino taking some part of the profits for ma running it. I can have it kind of run on the blockchain without anybody managing that, and I have guaranteed properties. I have guaranteed properties that if I won, I will get 200 krona, right? Because this is locked. The, the, the money are kind of locked in the transaction that you put in. And if there is a draw, I get my money back. And if I lost, I lost it, right? There is no dispute, there is nothing. It, it just works the way it should, right? So that's why the, the, the term contract comes from, that it's sort of the contract becomes the, the rules of the game, and they are unbreakable. You cannot break those rules because that's how it works. Uh, there is no human to say, ah, no, maybe he was a little bit too fast. Let's do it again. Maybe that, that wasn't exactly at the same time they, they played this rock, paper, scissors, right? Let's do retry. No, no, that it, it just works. It works always the same way, and it works always the same. Um, um, so th there are situations where um, Cryptography and the blockchain technology kind of allows us to do two things. One thing is we can have um, systems which are influence resistant, which are kind of control resistant uh, to some extent. Uh, the second thing is we have systems which don't require a third party trust. You can organize something without trusting anybody. And that's how kind of um, some of the um, some of the innovation in the, in the space actually is happening because criminals are really keen on using that because they don't trust anybody, but they still need to do business, right? Uh, if you want to sell drugs or do something illegal, you kind of don't really want to have anybody to say, oh, I really trust you, can you do this for us? For us? Uh, so they work in a very hostile environments where they rely on systems to work without kind of being easily compromised. Um, so they drove some of the innovations. So there was a kind of a famous computer scientist who wrote sort of a conceptually how a particular secure protocol could work without being able to track the transactions. Because in Bitcoin, you can track transactions because of the nature of the information stored in the blockchain. And then 
there was an uh, implementation which was really popular on the dark web which actually uses that system. Uh, so they um, innovate in kind of security mechanisms and uh, mechanisms to make sure that the system design is kind of bullet proof and it always does what it's supposed to do. Um, okay, so yes, so we discussed centralized versus decentralized. We discussed some of the um, um, things. The other one is that it's irreversible. Uh, most of the time, as with this game, um, once it happens, it happens. There is no sort of a falling back, uh, which has good and bad points as well. Because, for example, if you have if you ca came up with a system uh, for something and you deployed it into the blockchain, like Ethereum, for example, you cannot change it. So if there is a bug, the bug is there forever, right? So you have to have a mechanism for being able to tell all the stakeholders that this contract actually is now not correct. We have to migrate to a new contract because um, of the bug. And that migration requires everybody to agree or whatever the rules are. But you, if you didn't plan it, then you sort of stuck. And that's what happened in Ethereum in the early days that they planned this system for self-financing of projects. And it was buggy and somebody exploited it and then they couldn't really fix it without breaking the, um, the history of that all the transactions which happened in Ethereum. So they had sort of a, a forked uh, and now we have two Ethereum uh, networks. We have the one which is managed by the foundation, which did the fork. And we had the original one, which was started and kind of continued with the hack being part of it, right? So you, you see it, it's sort of, um, it has now from uh, two points, you have common history and then you have two separate histories. Um, okay, so um, yeah, we said we will not, uh, talk. We talked about the longest already. Um, we talked about the Bitcoin script. So script is this sort of ability to express logic. Uh, how complicated this logic can be? In the context of Bitcoin, not so much. It, it, it is just kind of, uh, you can verify things, you can verify hashes, and you can pass value from one place to the other, but you cannot do a lot. With Ethereum, on the other hand, you can do everything you want. Uh, Ethereum is trying to build a computer, distributed computer, which you can run any logic on. Uh, so it is sort of like um, Amazon Cloud without Amazon. Uh, what are the advantages? Well, the advantages are that it's not owned by anybody and it, ca it is kind of verifiably correct. Uh, the disadvantages are that it's extremely inefficient, right? It's much more efficient to run stuff on Amazon than to run stuff on Ethereum. And it costs you a lot of ether to run anything which is there. And the, the model works like this, that you have, um, you deploy particular application. Let's say I came up with this rock, paper, scissor game, and I put it out. So to put it out, I have to pay just a little bit. And then this game is there forever, and I don't pay anything anymore. But whoever will play the game, they have to pay for their transactions. And they pay a little bit every time they play the game, and the cost goes into the miners, the people who are mining the blocks. Right, so um, if the game is quite complex, this little fee for the transaction is actually quite expensive. And whoever is using it, they have to pay, right? Um, so by design, um, Bitcoin, yeah, it's Turing incomplete, which means not all programs can be expressed in Bitcoin logic. But Ethereum is Turing complete to some extent, and you can express any logic. It's just a matter of cost. Um, okay, we will not go into the um, details. I will tell you a little bit about additional project, which is um, related to BitTorrent, which is also related to blockchain technology, which is called IPFS. Um, I will put the slides later so you can watch the video. But the idea is that same as with um, Ethereum, which tries to democratize access to computation, to resources which are kind of computational um, programs, like, like the game like this. Um, this project tries to democratize access to files and to storage. Okay, So you can imagine you have, um, it's sort of like BitTorrent on steroids. Like imagine that everybody is uh, using BitTorrent. And then you can put in 
into the, the system any file you want. Suddenly, anybody can have access to anything that is out there, right? Uh, and it doesn't matter where it is, because you download it from the closest place you have, uh, because you don't have to download it from, um, uh, from inefficient location. Um, so it sort of works like uh, having nodes that participate. Uh, and you can participate as well. And you allocate uh, storage for files. So files are here. And then the system kind of exchanges information of where the files are. And you can say, I want this particular file, right? Um, to make things really easy, uh, the files cannot change. So the files are hashed. And you always know that if you request a particular hash, you will get that particular version of the file. So the files cannot kind of be changed on the fly because they are identified, uh, identified by the content that is inside. So for example, if you have a movie uh, and you hash it, the name of the movie is actually the hash. And you access all the files by those hashes. Um, so it's, it's kind of called content addressable file system because you request the information not by where it is, but what it is, right? So it's addressable by content. Um, and it has um, some nice properties. So for example, if you have a very large file and your neighbor already has this file, and you say, I need this file, you will get it from the neighbor, right? Um, so imagine you have a, a, a website with a lot of content. Currently, what we do, we pu put a browser and we say, we want this page from this location, right? Um, that's how it works. And then to make it efficient, we have a lot of machinery behind the scene to sort of distribute the content into multiple locations so it actually gets to you from the closers and, and so on and so forth. With this system, with IPFS, it, it is kind of given. You always have the ability to get the particular thing for, from the location that you need, um, which is the closest to you. The other advantage is, let's say you have, um, uh, you have a company and you release a game. Um, so you have a, a, a binary file, right? So you have a, I don't know, uh, I just wrote a, a small game for the um, first year design course, uh, which is called Roborun. <laughs> so I, I created a, a game and I, I built an executable, right? And now I can distribute it. So people can put it on the um, Android or iPhone devices. But some hackers kind of modified it and they put some malware into the file, right? Uh, and it's also called Roboran. It looks exactly like my game, right? And you don't know, as a user, you, if you download something, you don't know if it is clean or not. You have to use a virus detector to check if there is a malware inside your executable, right? But because I know that I haven't put any uh, malware into my, my own distribution, so I can use a hash, um, and I know that the content is this particular name, right? Um, so when I tell you download this game from this hash, you have a guarantee that it is what I built. It's not something modified, right? Uh, because the file system, the IPFS file system, um, IPFS guarantees that the content is exactly what it is. So there is, for example, um, a dependency tracker. Uh, when you're building software, you usually have some dependencies. Uh, and then those dependencies, again, can be um, hacked. And you can inject into building something, something that is not legitimate. It did happen in the past as well. Uh, so on top of the IPFS, you have a pack dependency tracker, which is called GX, which works exactly the same way. You say, I want dependency, wi which is this hash, and I'm guaranteeing that I will get that particular thing, not a modified one. So you have kind of a built-in mechanisms for um, tracking and checking authenticity of something. All right, so um, there are some additional uh, resources in the slides that you can, you can check. Um, unfortunately, this one seemed not to work. Um, I, I will put, put that online. Um, there are some additional uh, things that are happening in the kind of blockchain uh, cryptography space, which make potentially interesting applications. Um, so one of the... Um, one of the uh, novel concepts is related to um, uh, privacy. 
Um, and imagine that you have um, kind of a cloud uh, resource. So um, Amazon or um, Google Cloud. And you want to, um, to do some computation. So normally what you have to do, you have to give them the data and you have to uh, give them the program uh, which runs on some uh, computational resource which accesses the data, right? Uh, and you are, you are here. Um, so, and this cloud resource is some sort of um, institution or somebody r kind of owning the resources. And you have to trust them, right? So you have to put the trust that, first of all, they will not modify the program. They will run what you want to, to be run. Second of all, that they will not leak the data somewhere else. And third, uh, third that they will actually do what's supposed to happen, right? So you have to put a lot of trust into all those elements. And there is ongoing work in getting rid of those elements. So there is work which tries to encrypt the data in such a way that you can give untrusted resource uh, a computation which will happen on, on a data which they cannot really see. Uh, so this is uh, one of the aspects which is sort of developing. How can we protect the data such a way that we can do some computations on it, but it doesn't leak anywhere, right? So that's number one. The second one is how we can give the program uh, to somebody, and then when they give us an answer, verify that the answer is actually correct. Can we verify that whatever you're supposed to calculate was actually calculated correctly, right? Uh, this is called secure computing, and this is, um, it has kind of guarantees that if I gave you this to compute and you give me the number as an answer, I can verify that you actually did the computations. You just didn't give me kind of a, a random number or fake answer, right? But if I have to repeat the computations here, then it would make no sense, right? So uh, my verification, verifying that you've computed it has to be that computing it is much, much more time consuming, consuming and uh, resource intensive than verifying it, right? Otherwise, if I have to redo it, just to compare that you gave me the correct answer, it makes no sense. Uh, so there is work happening for that. Uh, and there is work combining both as well, right? So some uh, systems in the, in the blockchain are trying to, to do that uh, in such a way that it works seamlessly and data doesn't leak and it's verified, the computations are verified. So those are kind of interesting aspects. There is one extra one. So as we were discussing with um, currencies, uh, one, of the, um, one of the problems with currencies is that they are not uh, fungible, that you can track, even though you're using su uh, pseudonyms, uh, you can track how the money were flowing. So there is ongoing work in kind of uh, preventing that to happen. So you can kind of hide uh, the identity behind uh, some techniques to make it harder, right? So in Bitcoin, for example, there are Bitcoin mixers, which trying to kind of uh, mix the uh, transactions and addresses in such a way that it's harder to track transactions um, after the mixers, uh, and so on and so forth. But the more interesting one, which kind of uh, happens in, in um, day to day life is, how can you prove to somebody um, your identity, for example, or that you know something without revealing either what it is or revealing your identity, right? So imagine a situation where um, a police stops you and asks you for a driving license, right? Then you pull out your driving license and kind of give them. And on the driving license, there is your name, there is a date of birth maybe, there is a lot of personal information which they don't need. They only need to know that you have a driving license, right? Why all this information is given to them? Uh, because we don't have a system to not do that this way. Uh, historically, we were doing it this way. But there is a possibility already, it exists, it's a bit inefficient for large things, but for small things it's very efficient, that you can prove to somebody something without revealing 
either your identity or what it is, right? So you could imagine that a police stops you uh, and then you can show them something which proves to them that you have a driving license without telling them who you are, what is your name, what is your date of birth, anything like this, right? Um, it's it would be very useful. And it is already possible. So there are some kind of counterintuitive things coming from cryptography which are um, uh, getting more efficient and more um, robust to a point where you could use it in, in practice. Uh, this particular thing is called zero knowledge proofs and it's kind of an uh, ability to you to prove to somebody that you know something or that you have something without telling them what it is. Um, and it is, uh, yeah, it, it is a little bit counterintuitive because in the real world it's sort of hard to imagine how it would work. Uh, but 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 it is possible. All right, so we sort of went through um, most of those, uh, the most of the slides that worked. Um, we talked a little bit about the IPFS, the distributed file system. Why it is uh, interesting? It is interesting because it uses uh, concepts from BitTorrent and concepts from uh, version control to have kind of a robust system. And in fact, because the blocks are immutable as well, like in blockchain, once you have a block, it will never change. It's always the same. So it kind of renders itself really easily for IPFS like storage, because that's what you want. You want stuff that has a hash and never changes, kind of immutable. Um, we talked a little bit about um, scripting. Uh, so there is um, ability to express logic in, in Bitcoin. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, anonymity and uh, privacy of currencies. Um, so one of the techniques is called ring signature. Uh, again, without going into technical details, it allows a kind of uh, hiding. You can prove that you have a private key without revealing which of the public keys is yours, right? So you can sort of um, uh, provide a proof that you own something without revealing which public key belongs to you um, very quickly. Um, unfortunately, this one doesn't work, and this one had a little bit more high-level um, description of how Ethereum works and how you could potentially build like autonomous institutions which don't require um, kind of a human intervention. So you could imagine, uh, for example, the university degree system uh, to not involve administration, because if you pass the exams and if you have a certain amount of credits, the degree happens kind of automatically. It's sort of like the smart contract, like with the uh, rock, paper, scissor game, right? There is, there is no human needed to tell you that, yeah, the points add up and you have your degree. Uh, it can just happen. Uh, it's the same with driving license. If you pass the exams and you pass the, the driving test, the driving license just happens. You don't need kind of a human in the loop to, to va validate it or do things. So we have a lot of systems where you can kind of eliminate and, and mundane tasks, but you can also um, elevate systems where you will not need to put trust into kind of a human element, uh, which may or may not be a good thing. So there is a lot of um, a, a lot of cases where we rely on the human interpretation, right? Uh, so, for example, in legal systems, uh, if I have a contract with you uh, to do something, and we sort of don't agree. I don't know, we, we don't agree on some details. Uh, we can resolve it. We can uh, have kind of a legal advice or we can say, okay, we will interpret it this way and we kind of have an amendment to a contract. But if you have a contract in kind of a smart contract way, there is really hard to do that. There is no interpretation. You have to express things really clearly and really computationally precise. So then there is no uh, space for interpreting it. Um, same as with the normal kind of legal systems. Um, so there are some challenges and there are some opportunities of how this uh, may work. So where is blockchain kind of uh, booming? Well, it sort of uh, spikes um, interest everywhere where you have large number of participants which don't necessarily trust each other and they want to work together, but they don't know how without something which kind of unites them, right? So currencies like Bitcoin is one example. You have that in transportation and logistics, 
of passing goods around and tracking you know who got the goods when and in which uh, conditions uh, you so uh, logistics and kind of transportation you have uh, of course finance and interbank exchanges and so on they are really interested in using uh, mixed systems uh, which are public versus private blockchains for doing uh, account uh, clearing and clearing houses um, you have the insurance industry looking into uh, insurance claims and kind of offsetting the um, the risks to various entities uh, in the in the value chain which they use uh, you have the musicians w and kind of um, streaming platforms looking into micro payments and credit based payments based on which songs were used when and how how that that works uh, you have a lot of um, IOT companies looking into microtransactions and um, things being used with um, with those smart contracts. There are, for example, startup in Germany which has uh, a lock which you can install anywhere, like for example for a washing machine or for entering a flat, uh, and then it's being unlocked by you paying. So if you have, like, let's say, a public washing machine, you can use it if you use your smartphone and make a small deposit for using the, the device, right? So that is kind of a generic solution for uh, uh, kind of like renting utilities. Um, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting for some of the um, car rental companies as well. There are some which also use like a smart lock where you can unlock the car and use it for a for a period. There is one which using bicycles as well. Um, so there are kind of different use cases where you um, provide some sort of trust and some sort of a uh, guarantees for uh, not necessarily trusted parties which are using it. Uh, and you uh, make kind of like an uh, enabler for the interaction to happen without knowing the details about who they are or you know, uh, they not needing to trust you necessarily because it's sort of uh, offsetting the, the trust relationship somewhat. Um, any questions? So what did you find the most interesting? Yes. Uh, they redesigning it now. They rebuilding the fundamental protocols. Um, so they had problems with scalability, and also there is this typical problem of burning computational resources for doing proof of work. Uh, they will be experimenting with the proof of stake, which is a different mechanism for guaranteeing that nobody cheats in the network. As we were discussing with the peer-to-peer -peer systems, you don't have guarantees, so you have to enforce some rules to have those guarantees. An easy one is the proof of work, uh, but it is inefficient. Like it, it is sort of costly to do that, uh, and also environmentally, you may say, uh, not good. Uh, but yeah, proof of stake is another mechanism where you can say you want, if you want to be trusted, you have to bet certain amount of stake, and if you are wrong, you're gonna lose that stake, right? Um, Th there are some problems with it because the rich ones can still 